there. Hi there. How are you? I'm fine. Long time. Yes, indeed. Good to see you. Yes, you too. Uh, thank you so much for doing this. My pleasure. You know, it's, it's been fun to watch one of our own, an ID icon, become such a national brand for trusted health information. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. Yeah. But what, you know, I, I, sent, I posted um, on my social media that I'd be talking to you and I asked people for questions. Oh, good. So I'll ask you a few of those questions. Uh, but what I think people really want to know is on a scale of one to 10, how well did Brad Pitt do with his impersonation of you on SNL? Yeah, I think it's at least an eight. I mean, he got the voice, the gravelly voice well. His Brooklyn accent wasn't so bad either. <laughs> so I think he did a good job. He's a great actor. So, you know, it was easy for him. Yeah. So I watched the program last night. Uh, with Black Coalition Against COVID and BlackDoctor.org on trust in the Black community. And, um, you know, you said something at the end that I, I actually hadn't thought about before, framing it in that way, and that was uh, before your, this happened before your time and beyond your control, and right. reminding us that we do have control. So thank you so much for that perspective. That was great. Oh, you're welcome. You're welcome. Yeah. So... I want to tell you a little bit about what I've been doing in the community and then get specific on some of the issues that I think are challenging with respect to trust in the vaccine. Since the, since the shutdown, I've actually still been in the community. In addition to my ID practice, people have come to know me as Dr. Lisa on the street. And I go out on street corners and talk to people about health issues. And so I've been talking to people about uh, the pandemic, the, the vaccine. And I think part of, uh, well, a big part of the, the distrust is because people still don't understand. They don't understand the language we're using. Um, they don't understand cell biology. We shouldn't expect them to. Um, so I know you've talked a lot about Operation Warp Speed and how fast the process is going and reassuring people that there's integrity in the process. But what I think is still missing for people is clarity about messenger RNA. What is that? Most of the explanations talk about DNA and ribosomes and cytoplasm and cells and it's really, it's missing, um, it's, it's missing some detail or clarity for people. And I usually use metaphors a lot. So when I talk about the flu vaccine, I might say, the purpose of a vaccine is to put, put on your, your armor so that you can protect yourself, or it's a dress rehearsal in case, um, you know, so that you're ready for the big show. So can you help people understand messenger RNA? Sure. sure. Okay, so when the body, when you're trying to get the body to make an immune response, against an infection, which means you're trying to prep the body so that when the infection, in this case, the COVID-19 virus or SARS coronavirus 2, gets into your nose and tries to infect you and make you sick, the body needs to develop these mechanisms, which are kind of like soldiers to fight off the virus from making you sick. Those soldiers are referred to as antibodies, which are just proteins that the body makes to protect you against any outside threat. Everybody has the capability, with few exceptions, of making these antibodies. Now, when you get infected in reality, your body makes the antibodies to clear the infection. But in order to protect you against infection, you have to kind of fool the body into thinking that it's getting infected by vaccinating them with something that is safe, that doesn't cause them to get sick, but that triggers a response that ultimately protects you against the real virus when you get exposed to the real virus. And one of those things that the body sees and responds to is a protein that is part of the coronavirus. And we refer to that protein as the spike 
protein. And the reason we call it a spike, because if you look at the virus under the microscope, it looks like a round ball with all of these little spikes coming out, which makes it look almost like a crown. And that's why they call it coronavirus, because corona means crown. Mm -hmm. So you want to get the body to respond to one of those spikes. So there are several ways to show the body this spike. You could either give the whole virus that has a lot of spikes, that's not so good. I mean, it can be done, but it's a little bit dangerous sometimes if you make sure you got to inactivate it. So you want to do it really safe. What you do is you could either give the body the protein itself, just make a whole bunch of protein, or you can do something that's really a neat mechanism. And that is that every time a protein gets made, it has a genetic code which essentially triggers it to make a protein. That genetic code is called RNA. So RNA is a genetic material that kind of writes the prescription or the code to get that protein to be formed. So when you get a messenger RNA vaccine, you get this RNA, which is this genetic material that's very safe. It's not going to interfere with your genes. It's not going to do anything with your cells. It's a piece of genetic material that you insert the code that writes the prescription for this protein. So you get that gene, you stick it in this message, you inject it into your body. And as soon as it goes into your body, it starts writing this prescription and this protein comes out. The body sees the protein and you make a good response and you're protected. And we found out that in fact, the protection is so good that it's about 95% protecting you from clinical disease with COVID-19. Outstanding. That was excellent. I love that. Uh, people are also asking, we've been trying for decades to develop an HIV vaccine. Why can't we use the same technology to develop an HIV vaccine since it's so much faster? Well, that's, it's faster, but the only trouble is for reasons that are very complicated, the body does not really like to make a good immune response against HIV, even against natural infection, which is the reason why amazingly of all the tens of millions of people who are infected with HIV, there are no documented instances of anybody who has spontaneously cleared the virus from their own body. That's amazing, but it's true. And the reason is, this is a very strange virus that the body does not make an adequate response against, and it keeps changing also. So, the easiest way to know that you're going to be successful with a vaccine is how the body makes a response against natural infection. If the body makes a really good response against natural infection and ultimately clears the virus, then that's a signal that there's a really good chance that a vaccine is going to be successful. And in fact, even in those diseases, that are very serious and can either cause illness or death in many people, those diseases usually the majority of people recover. For example, smallpox, you know, 80% of the people recover from smallpox. Polio, 99.9% .9 of the people recover from polio. Measles, 90 plus percent of the people recover from measles, which means that the body really knows how to make a good response against smallpox, polio, and measles, which is exactly the reason why it was pretty easy, quite frankly, you know, with all due respect to the people who were working hard on it, it was pretty easy to make a vaccine against smallpox, polio, and measles, because the body already told you mm. that it knows how to make a good immune response. The body is telling us it doesn't know how to make a good response against HIV, but it's also telling us it knows how to make a good response against coronavirus. 
because most of the people who get infected with coronavirus clear it and are protected against subsequent exposure, which means it is very likely that we're gonna get a successful vaccine against coronavirus. And as a matter of fact, we already have two very effective vaccines against coronavirus, the Pfizer product and the Moderna product. Yeah, we're hearing a lot about those. I, I want to talk a little bit more about how we can engender trust around science research and uh, vaccines. A few months ago, but this past summer, I encountered a man on the street who told me he didn't want to take Trump's vaccine. So we had a conversation about um, understanding the difference between science and political language or political rhetoric. And I also reminded him that all the medications people take go through a similar research process. So what are your thoughts about that? Or what advice do you give the community in trying to sort out the political noise from the, uh, from the science? Well, I think that the way you put it is a good step in that direction, is to carefully and patiently explain in language that everyone can understand what the process is of developing a vaccine, why it's made so quickly. It's not rushed in a reckless way. It's quick because it's taking advantage of exquisite scientific advances in vaccine platform technology so that you can safely do things in weeks to months that you couldn't do in more than several years in the past. So they need to understand that we're the beneficiaries of years of advances in science that has nothing to do with politics. Yeah. So therefore, when you say Trump's vaccine, it's not. It's, it's science's vaccine. It's not a politician's vaccine. Yeah. It's not my vaccine. It's the science that's made the vaccine. Yeah. Okay. Um, another question um, folks are asking is about how well it protects uh, our elders. They're at the front of the line, as you know, for vaccination, but many of them don't respond as well to vaccines. So do we know how well it works, especially since there are groups with chronic health conditions uh, that should also get the vaccine and be prioritized? Yes, so in the vaccine trials, we paid particular attention to get representation from diverse groups. So they were divided into three general groups. One, normal healthy people less than 65, people of any age with underlying conditions, and people older than 65. So we had the elderly, we had those with underlying conditions, and we had essentially normal people of of non-elderly group. So right away, the vaccine trials, which for Moderna was 30,000 people, and for Pfizer was 44,000 people. And that's a lot of people to figure out, A, does it work? And B, is it safe? And we found out, as you know, from the announcements, that it is very efficacious, namely, it's 95% effective and it's very, very safe. Yeah, you know, one of the ways I thought I could be of service to uh, engender trust is I actually signed up to be in the Moderna trial. You did? So I'm a trial participant at GW. So I've been talking about that on social media and, you know, it's changed some minds really when they hear my story and hear uh, that I, you know, I'm still, I don't have, you know, two, two extra fingers and toes. And uh, so I'm gonna keep telling the story. To, right. You know, to encourage people as much as I can. Well, good for you. Keep it up. Yeah. So the last thing I want to tell you before we go, I mentioned I asked people for questions, but in addition to questions, I also got a lot of praise. So I want to share a few of these with you. Tell him, thank you. We appreciate you. Tell him how much we love him, always following science and protecting us. Does he have a favorite bar so I can buy him drinks for a week? 
<laughs> and finally, a reference from the movie A Few Good Men. Thanks for being on the wall, Dr. Fauci. Uh, so we appreciate your service, your steadiness, and on behalf of BlackDoctor.org, the Black Coalition Against COVID, and Grapevine Health, thank you so much, and Godspeed, Dr. Fauci. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to have been with you. Thank you for having me.